Welcome, everyone, to this week's uh, call with none other than Dr. Anton House. We will have a lot of interesting things to discuss from what creates innovation, what were like some of the innovations that were really behind the Industrial Revolution, uh, property rights regime and intellectual property rights regime, um, and many other interesting things, including also what produces wealth, what was behind the Industrial Revolution, and what we can expect from the world uh, going forward. So it will be jam-packed, and I'm very happy to see so many of you joining us here today. And um, hi, my name is uh, Dr. Wolf von La, and I'm the CEO of Students for Liberty, the largest pro-liberty student organization around the world. Uh, just in the last three months, we had over 800 events like this um, all around the world. Over, what is it now, 230,000 people were watching our stuff online. We have also a great YouTube channel. Check it out, Learn Liberty and uh, so much more. So if you're a student and interested in the ideas of liberty, uh, please join us so that you can see many more of uh, exciting topics like this one. But now, let me introduce you to Anton. Dr. Anton Haus uh, has been writing a very exciting book recently. Uh, do you have it next to you? Can you show it yeah, off for I do. us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be beautiful, show it. Arts and Minds. And uh, it's, a, it's his first book. And it has quite the interesting topic. It's about how the Royal Society of Arts changed the nation. And the Royal Society of Arts is actually a private organization who has helped a lot of inventors um, during the Industrial Revolution and even afterwards to create more innovation. So it's, it's a very unique concept and he wrote about that. Now Anton is working on a book regarding the causes of Industrial Revolution. And we know that there's many academic theories like what caused it but Anton knows better. And he has uh, reviewed over, what is it? A little bit less than 1,500 unique inventors during that time to come up with his thesis. And he will tell us more about that. But more important about all the stuff he's writing, he is a product of King's College London, which is uh, also my alma mater. And uh, Anton and I, we were working on our PhDs during the same time. And we also might have, um, drunken a couple of bottles of kava while editing uh, some, some papers and reviewing some of the uh, students' work. So if people got like better grades during that time, it's probably because he and I had a couple of uh, alcoholic beverages during that time. <laughs> but uh, Anton kept busy um, and he then got a postdoc um, at Brown University, another very prestigious university. And he is writing about all these topics that we're talking about right now. And you can follow me on Twitter at Anton House and you can also check out his newsletter. But Anton, how are you today? I'm good, thanks. Good to see you again, Wolf. And yes, many fond memories of drinking, uh, I guess marking under the influence, it might be called. Although I think those <laughs> grades went pretty well. So. <laughs> yes, we were very objective, um, we, very we tried objective. to be, um, but very good. But one of the, the questions that you're grappling with right now is one of the most foundational, because people often ask, what is the result of poverty? What mm -hmm. causes poverty? But in my opinion, that's the one question we have to ask, like, what is it that causes prosperity? And the biggest explosion in prosperity in Europe and then around the world started with the Industrial Revolution. So why do you think it happened in the UK? What is your thesis? Yeah, so I think that, put, that hits the nail on the head, right? The thing that we really want to explain here is what causes economic growth? Well, really, and, and we shouldn't just be focusing on things like GDP statistics or the kind of measurable aspect. Really, what causes increases, steady increases every single year, year on year, year on year, for hundreds of years in living standards, right? Just our ability, you know, not just how much wealth we're creating, but also all of the other things that come along with that. Our health, our prosperity, our ability to lead, uh, lead actualized lives and and you know have beautiful designs and eat great food and all of those sorts of things alongside that as well. Um, so what are the causes, I guess, of human flourishing is one of the key things to look at. And my, my main hypothesis and the thing that I've been working on, you know, since I was doing that PhD um, back at King's and I think Arts and Minds, my book is also part of this. Um, all of that really comes down to how it is that inventors themselves not really as individuals, but individuals and in small groups um, created the institutions that then supported innovation that meant that it spread further. So one of the amazing, one of the really interesting things I noticed amongst those 1,500 roughly, uh, it's a bit under that, um, inventors, this large, large sample, was that 
nearly all of them were in some way involved with creating pro-innovation institutions from the patent system to copyrights to exhibitions um, to setting up societies like the Royal Society or like the Royal Society of Arts, right? All of these kind of pro-innovation institutions. And I think what makes Britain special relative to a lot of other places is that it's not so much that it had inventors. Other places, of course, had inventors long, you know, in many other parts of Europe and even long before the British Industrial Revolution. But what they were very good at was creating those institutions and really making sure that they were long lasting, that they continued to build on one another, that you have this kind of positive self-reinforcing cycle. In, in, in other words, it's that the British inventors were a bit better at spreading what I like to call an improving mentality, being able to look at the world and see room for improvement and thus become an inventor. That is fascinating. Um, normally, if you look at a standard economic textbooks, uh, people would say it was because there was uh, property rights, there was the rule of law, there was a free exchange of goods and services, free floating prices. So was all of that given in the in the UK or did that come after the fact? Like what is the chicken and egg problem? Uh, can you walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, those things are in some respects important as kind of factors that you probably need to have in order to have that kind of increase, that this that kind of economic growth. But it doesn't seem to be sufficient on its own, right? You had lots of other societies in which you had free exchange of goods, you had trade, um, you had property rights of certain different kinds or diff under different regimes. Um, but despite all of that, you don't necessarily automatically get economic growth. You don't automatically get this, especially innovation-led economic growth. Right, because there are different causes of economic growth, but they only get you so far. In order to have this continuous year on year improvement again and again and again and again for decades and even centuries, you need to keep constantly coming up with new technologies to push the technological frontier out further. So I think those things are important. I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay those things. It's just that they're clearly not enough. Um, and seemingly, once you've got this explosion of innovation, even in cases where you have weak property rights, or where you have very expropriative states, like even the Soviet Union, you can still get invention, right? Once you've let the, the invention genie out of the bottle, it seems to have a life of its own, right? There are very few societies in which now, all across the world, you don't get that much invention, right? You have to be as extreme as some, somewhere like North Korea to really kind of dampen that, that kind of spirit, if you like. If you look at Britain, let's say, you know, over the past 200 and something years, you've had nationalizations, you've had privatizations, you've had you know, command and control structures in place, you've had loosenings of that, you've had rationing, you've had free trade, you've had protectionism. And yet, for that whole period, you've basically had a pretty steady state of growth um, for that entire time. So clearly, some, once the genie was out of the bottle, you, you're able to get this kind of continuous improvement. It seems to work despite certain things, obviously acting against it. And my other great example of this is France, right? France is already on its fifth republic. But, you know, in all of those different changes of power from monarchy to, to um, republic to back to monarchy to empire back to republic again, right? Despite all of the violence that you get and the expropriation that you get, Somehow that's, you know, France is still amongst one of the wealthiest countries in the world or amongst one of the wealthiest countries ever to exist, right, as a society in terms of the, 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 the height of its living standards. And throughout that whole period, although sometimes inventors and scientists were getting killed as part of those changes, or many of them fled as part of those changes, somehow you still had enough of those people there to continue pushing that technological frontier outwards, to continue improving living standards, despite all of that violence, despite all of that change. That's fascinating. And you were talking about specific institutions. So now there are many other authors that say institutions are, were pivotal for industrial revolution and for prosperity in general. So one of the, the thinkers are, is, of course, Deirdre McCloskey, Professor mm -hmm. Deirdre McCloskey. And she, she made the argument that it's mostly about the values that people hold as more of like soft institutions or uh, instead of like more like property rights. So how would you, maybe you can explain for like 10 seconds, what, what 20 seconds, what her thesis is and how yours differs and what kind of institutions you're actually talking about that produces more invention and more innovators? Mm. So I guess one way to, to define the difference between our two theories is that McCloskey thinks that there are certain factors that kind of lifted constraints on what people would always have already done. 
right? So there's liberty, that's very important, that allows people to do things. And there's dignity, which is a kind of lifting the social constraint of being able to be an entrepreneur, um, to be an innovator as well. And she thinks that, you know, a lot of work has been done on liberty. And so her thesis is all about bourgeois dignity, that you get this, again, a lifting of constraints. She likes to say that these constraints get lifted so people just have a go. I think it's slightly different to that. I think that even when you lift those constraints, you don't, people don't necessarily have a go. That innovation is not an obvious choice that people will just do unless they've seen other people innovating, unless they've been inspired to innovate. So a big part of my theory is not just about this improving mentality and, and how that kind of works within for any particular inventor, but also the fact that it seems to spread from person to person. Right, so you've always had people who've been improvers, who've, who've been inventors, but they've always been very few of them. And most people, I think, in general, are not optimizers. They're not improvers. They don't look at the way they do things and think, how can I be a bit more efficient? How can I, you know, how can I make my life a bit more beautiful? How can I make it a bit better? A lot of people are perfectly content to say, this is the way things are. It's fine. And I'm not going to bother trying to change it. Or if I try to, try to change it, it'll be minor. It'll be kind of... You know, how many people, when they commute to work every day, try to work out if they can do it a bit faster or if they can find a shortcut? No, they just continue to, to go in their particular route that they've always done because that's the one they're familiar with and they're not going to try and waste any resources and experimenting and trying to change that, even though it might end up being saving them, you know, quite, quite, quite a significant amount in time later in, later in life. So because improvement is very rare, I think what you get is that when you have a few improvers, they can be extremely influential if they come into contact with other people, if they can inspire those other people to become improvers as well. I'm sure you found this as well with SFL, right? That a lot of, you know, very, there are very few libertarians. And how do you get more libertarians? Well, they've often met another libertarian, right? There's this network effect that actually the, the network there matters and also the ability of people to be inspiring matters as well that you don't really get change without people seeing that there's this other thing that could have happened i'm sure people have invented libertarianism many times over separately all over the world but rarely does it kind of gather momentum and turn into a kind of wider movement you, re you require people to organize to create institutions from the bottom up sometimes or to lobby for top-down institutions that will support that and actually build it into a movement so i like to think of this as a kind of you get this kind of inventor ideology in a sense, and it, in much the same way as a political ideology spreads, that, and exactly the same factors that result in political ideology spreading are also the same factors that result in invention as a, pro, as a kind of thing that people do spreading as well. Yeah, that gives me a lot, lot to think about. There's definitely some fascinating insights there. So that you, you're talking about a, a network effect so in your research, are there some ways how that can be cultivated more? Is it just about like bringing different inventors in, in the same room? Is it these inventors talk more openly about what they're doing, more people get an interest? And um, a question connected to that is like, if that's the case, how can we create more innovations today if we know that? Maybe in doing schools or apprenticeships, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I think those are, that's the right question to ask is how can we make inventors more inspiring or put them into contact with other inventors so that that inspiration spreads. A lot of innovation policy focuses on what I would call something much further down the stream, which is, you know, how do we get more people who are already inventors to invent a bit more? Or how do we get people who are already inventors to get a bit more funding? Whereas the question we really need to be asking is how do we just get more inventors in general? And then we can deal with those things a bit later. So I think a large part of it is Again, that there's a whole different ways, a whole different set of ways in which you can do this. You can set up societies where you provide a home for inventors to talk to one another. You know, you don't want people kind of to get um, discouraged by doing things on their own, not getting much in the way of, you know, validation. It could be in terms of not just kind of their financial success, but how much social prestige do they get, right? So having things like in the 1660s, organizations like the Royal Society, being set up, right? This is something where they're trying to get the king to mark his stamp and say, look, the things that scientists are doing are actually quite valuable. And a lot of inventors are also doing stuff around that science. Later on in the 1750s with the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, so that the, what I wrote my first book about, which later on becomes a royal one as well, confusingly. That Society of Arts was meant to be 
to fill a gap where people thought, OK, we've got this scientific society, the Royal Society, but they're doing too much science, not enough invention, right? too much theory, not enough of actual application to the real world, trying to make rate, use the theory to raise living standards. Um, instead, they just keep plowing away at theories. Um, and so they set up this new society to try and concentrate on application. So one of the things they did was they gave prizes to non-patented inventions. So they recognized that the patent system seemed to play a role and was quite important in many ways, but they wanted to complement that. So provide an alternative where if the patent system wasn't appropriate to certain types of invention or to certain people, um, there would be a new outlet for them. And so they would give cash prizes, um, often fairly small, but actually kind of substantial relative to, to what you might get. Maybe not as much as you get from you know, creating a hugely popular business off this thing or exploiting a patent and having this temporary monopoly, but still enough to be a bit of a reward or honorary prizes. So, you know, medals that you get presented to you by some duke or some earl or something. And this kind of, you know, if you're a relatively poor farmer of some kind or a relatively provincial some person in the, in the middle class somewhere in the country, you know, these are the sorts of honors that can be quite significant. And so you get, as a result of this, the kinds of inventions that wouldn't ordinarily be patented being rewarded and being encouraged and then being publicized as well and spreading knowledge further. Um, things like agricultural techniques, um, things like semaphore. So, you know, the ability to communicate between ships using flags or different kind of signaling systems. So it's not the sort of thing you can patent because it's very difficult to monopolize that, but you might want to promote those sorts of things and publicize them and, and reward them. Likewise, people who maybe couldn't afford a patent because it was an extremely expensive process and very political process in those days, you know, you had to go to London and pay a lot of bribes and, you know, do a lot of lobbying. Um, some estimates say that, you know, if you were to try to estimate it, you know, in real terms, it'd be something like £300,000 in today's money. Wow. Um, so do the conversion from your head, not to mention the time that you'd spend in London trying to do all that lobbying, going from office to office, you know, real kind of nightmarish bureaucratic system. Um, so people who are too poor to patents would often just think, you know, I, I could just get this prize from the, from, from the Society of Arts much easier. Um, or people who are too rich to patent for whom maybe it's a vulgar thing to be involved in commerce, you know, something that's actually kind of anti McCloskey's bourgeois dignity idea, but they don't want to sully their hands with something as, you know, horrible as, as money. Um, you know, never, never mention the, the money kind of attitude, but they might get honorary medals. Um, so the society gave prizes for all sorts of things that targeted the aristocracy. You know, you're not going to be able to appeal to them with a cash prize, but you can appeal to them in terms of honor. So that, I think, gives a flavor of the kinds of um, things that they were doing. Also, you know, the other kinds of things that they would um, promote as part of that, or they would get submissions sent to them, um, would be the sorts of inventions where people didn't think it was right to patent them, um, where you know, safety improvements for workers, for consumers, life-saving inventions when it comes to saving people from shipwreck, for example, or, you know, or from drowning in a river, those sorts of things, um, or that had this wider public interest. Um, so I think that gives a flavor of the sorts of institutions that I'm talking about here. They're often these bottom-up things where they're trying to fill gaps in what's already being done trying to promote innovation um, in new ways and then spread it further. Because the other context here is that invention happens all the time, um, but very rarely did you used to have in, uh, institutions that would actually capture that invention. So, you know, people keep, like to keep things secret because the most effective monopoly is one where you, you can't necessarily just copy it. Um, but the problem with keeping secrets is that if you die or if there's an accident of some sort, then that secret is lost forever. And the, whatever technological improvement that, that came about has just been wiped out. And we basically, as a society, have to start from scratch. Very interesting. So you're describing, and that's probably not the, the technical terms that you would be using, but it seems like a flourishing culture of innovation where people come together, talk about that. They, they have badges of honor having innovated um, and they have created a couple of inventions. They get social prestige via medals and, or like royal acknowledgement or with the local uh, person in charge. Uh, maybe there's like mag magazines that talk about innovation. So it becomes more of a lifestyle thing. So that, that's very interesting um, to, to think about it that way. And nowadays, I mean, we might have the same thing with business, but not so much about inventions necessarily. Um, but maybe we can get back to that at some point. But most people probably don't think 
themselves as inventors that they could create something. Mm. Um, I don't think that there's so many people out there like tinkering. Um, I mean, of the world scale, of course, but but generally, I, I don't think that most people say like, "Hey, I want to become like an inventor." Um, but I think your research has shown that very ordinary people can become inventors. You, you don't need to necessarily be special. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your research has found, having reviewed over 1,400 inventors? What kind of commonalities do these mm. individuals have? What kind of characteristics? Um, share some of the interesting insights that you have there, please. Yeah, so one of the basic ones is that they can be from any background, right? So within that data set, I've got Anglicans, I've got dissenters, I've got Jews, I've got Catholics, I've got women, I've got men, I've got immigrants, I've got native you know, Brits, I've got all sorts of different people um, from whatever background you can think of, rich, poor, middle class, clergymen, engineers, you know, every professional background as well. It seems as though what really ties them together is this attitude, this mentality, right, that they, the way I like to describe it, they often use sort of similar terms themselves. And so I'm kind of drawing this from the way they will often describe their processes, seeing room for improvement, seeing that things could be better, right? That's the first step. And then doing something about it. Um, so, you know, a lot of people might have that mentality and just complain about things and whinge all the time. Um, these, I guess, are the whingers who figure out that actually maybe they'll have a go at trying to do the improvement themselves. So, you know, if you're, oh, I don't know, you're a bit annoyed that the that your local restaurant is a bit slow at, at, at producing something or they don't have a bit of a production line going when you're trying to order your coffee, you know, these are the people who are complaining about that and thinking, you know, I don't know with a bit of division of labor, you can do that. Look, here's how you do it. You, this is how you can make things that slight, that slight bit more efficient, that slight bit better. Uh, and obviously improvement in, in some ways is subjective, right? What is better? It could be more beautiful, it could be faster, it could be stronger, it could be, I mean, these are the sorts of um, different things that they're doing. And sometimes the kinds of improvements they're coming up with, you know, they're improvements on one metric and not on another, but the main thing is they're improving. And so it seems to be accessible to anyone because that mentality is universal. Right? This is the thing about the Society of Arts as well, is that it's set up as a kind of improvement agency, you know, subscription funded, bottom up improvement agency, and when it comes up with improvements, once it's done those things, it then needs to find something else to improve. And so the, the organization as a whole almost becomes this encapsulation of improvement as this idea, because it's constantly having to reinvent itself, constantly having to find new things um, to make better. And ultimately anything and everything can be made better. Um, so that's part of it. And so part of the implication of that also is that a lot of these inventors are polymaths. Right. These are people who are not improving just in a single field or a single industry. I don't know, an engineer who just does steam engines. They're not specializing that much. They they tend to, you know, the guy who's doing steam engines is also thinking, well, why don't I do a bit of um, dabbling in chemistry and you know, invent a better process for using chlorine to bleach clothes? Or why don't I come up with some slight civil engineering impro improvements, you know, better bridges or better canals or better pots and or more beautiful designs for stamps or something? Right. I'm kind of drawing think, a few examples sorry to interrupt, there. But I think it was 55% of, of your people were polymaths, right? Yeah, so the majority of them, wow. and actually the 55% is a kind of underestimate. So it's me trying to say, here's the kind of minimum baseline. It's actually probably more than that. Um, and related to that is the, uh, this fact that uh, not only can they be involved in lots of different industries, but you don't actually have to be from within an industry to improve it. Right, you could very easily be an outsider to it, or you could have no experience at all of an industry. So take um, Edmund Cartwright, who's one of these more famous inventors for the power loom, so the automated, you know, mechanized loom. You know, taking a power source like a horse or a bull or water or wind, and and doing the weaving without having someone there to do it. This guy's a clergyman, He's just an Anglican clergyman, right? The the local vicar, who loves experimenting. It's not like he had any experience of, of machinery before this. And so what you find is a lot of people are able to simply teach themselves in order to in, get to the improvements that they want to achieve. Um, or they just rely on other people who have that expertise, but aren't necessarily inventors, right? So people who have that kind of know-how and they'll just kind of contract it out in some ways, right? Invention as a process seems to be this kind of this thing that can be relatively specialized because you can find the engineers to make your vision a reality. Um, or a mechanic to, to make your vision a reality. Um, or you could just teach yourself. And so a lot of 
again, coming back to the institutions that are important, the kinds of things that make that a bit easier are very, are very valuable and very vital, right? As you mentioned journals as being part of this ecosystem of this culture of inventorship, if you like, this, in, this new um, identity. Things like encyclopedias, things like the mechanics magazine, things like journals that are publishing the latest inventions, they're also a part of that. And again, interestingly, nearly all of them are set up by inventors. So again, the, the inventors are creating, they're doing, they're not just doing the improvements in the kind of technical sense, but they're also creating institutional innovations. They're coming up with new ways to promote the kind of general activity that they do as well better. It's fascinating. So if, if any of you want to want to try becoming an inventor, uh, you have good chances. Uh, you just have to talk to a lot of other inventors, uh, it seems like it, and dabble with things. Even if it's if you're a lawyer, dabble with other stuff, uh, because it seems like uh, you don't have to find the, the innovation just within your background because it seems that they're coming from all kinds of different uh, backgrounds. And that's, that's certainly very interesting insights. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the Royal Society of Arts. Uh, it sounds very official. It sounds very royal, of course, um, and very prestigious, but it's actually a private organization that has supported inventions for centuries now. Um, how this, tell us a little bit about how this came about and how did they really help some of these in, inventions? Because it's a little bit atypical, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, so don't be put off by the royal. What happens is that in 1754, 11 people um, meet up in a coffee house and declare themselves to be the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. That's pretty much how it gets started. And they decide that they will pay in two guineas a year or 20 guineas for life as members and if you're a member, then you have a say in everything that they'll do with that accumulated fund, right? So it's a subscription-based um, thing, but also a direct democracy originally in the first hundred years. So if you were a member, if you paid your paid up your dues, your membership fees, then you could stand up at the meeting, you know, originally around the coffee house table, eventually this kind of arena-like room, you know, with kind of horseshoe-shaped um, thing with benches, a bit like kind of European Parliament style type thing. Um, and you could have your say, you could say, I think we should have a prize for so and so invention, or I think this is some big major social problem, can we come up with a technological solution to it. Um, so a great example of that would be uh, child labour, right, a lot of the some of their some of the uh, members in the late 18th and early 19th century were very concerned by the fact that you had kids sometimes as young as four who were being sent up chimneys to clean them and you know dying of horrific cancers by their 20s or dying in horrific accidents even before then um, that they were being exploited they were being underpaid if they were paid at all they were sometimes kids who were being kidnapped from one city and taken to another to be forced into this kind of labor um, and so they thought you know how are we going to abolish this well it's difficult to find an alternative because kids are the only people who fit up these chimneys right it, you know, there aren't many people small enough to be able to do this kind of job. And so they come up with a, a, a prize, or they suggest a prize, working with other reformers who are campaigners who are concerned about this, to come up with a, te a technological solution, to create a machine that will do this for you. Um, and that's exactly what they do. Just, a, a, you know, a, a year or two later, they get a submission that worked perfectly well. And when they have that technological solution, they were then able to push for laws that could then back that up and say, you should be using this and not be using kids. Um, so that's, I think, a really good example of the kind of bottom up social campaigning that you get from this institution. Um, and loads of the prizes that they give, they give well over 2000 prizes for inventions and many more prizes for artistic um, compositions as well, because they, you know, they try to improve the full panoply of the arts, meaning not just fine art, you know, painting and sculpture and architecture, but arts as, as being like arts of man, you know, artifice, you know, everything that is made by people, but rather than made by God or nature. Um, so the Society of Arts, in terms of what it means, is about, you know, improving what it is that we do as, 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 as humans. And often with that social, often with that public effect as well. So to recap there, direct democracy, subscription funded, private institution, and the, really the royal just comes in a bit later uh, because they get quite, you know, either members of the royal family or you know, dukes and so on, increasingly senior people to be a kind of honorary president. Um, and they're given this title because 
you know, in those days, you know, limited liability and incorporating a company is now very common, but um, before the 1850s, you pretty much needed either an act of parliament or a royal charter in order to be able to do that. And so in the, in the mid 19th century, they decided to become royally chartered so they can be an official organization rather than a kind of unincorporated association, which they would have been before then. Um, so that's what they're doing for the first hundred years is this direct democracy. And then in the 19th century, they start to be taken over. Their membership declines quite dramatically, but is then taken over by a bunch of radical utilitarians. Um, and they have slightly different ideas about how inventions should be promoted. They don't think prices are as effective. They're much more relaxed with, with patents. They think that intellectual property works quite well. Actually, the society gets involved with radically reforming the patent system, making it much more like the American system, so much cheaper, um, less corrupt, with fewer stages that you have to go through, you know, fewer officials you have to bribe or you have to talk to, um, where it's actually about promoting invention and not just kind of this holdover from the privileges that monarchs used to give, you know, the kind of monopoly privileges that they would give either to favourites or to immigrants to bring over new industries and so on. A very ad hoc thing where it's ultimately the monarch decides. So they're involved with those sorts of campaigns and they also have this idea of using exhibitions. Um, which I think is a very underrated but really interesting way of promoting invention, um, which is that they notice that the French, um, in order to try and catch up with Britain during the Industrial Revolution, the French had been using national exhibitions of industry. What they would do is they would get the government, um, would fund a big exhibition in Paris, and they would get all of the manufacturers from the south of France, and the north of France, the east of France, and the west of France to send their manufacturers, to send their machines, all to, and their designs they were producing all into the same building so that people could see like, you compare like with like. So the manufacturer of, you know, the weaver from the south of France could look at what they're doing in the north and say, oh, they're actually doing this a bit more efficiently than I am. Here's how I, and I can see in the same room how I could change this to, to make it slightly better. When it comes to designs, consumers could look at what they could buy from the, you know, locally in the north of France or in Paris and say, oh, actually, it seems that this stuff, much nicer stuff is available. These much more pleasant designs or much nicer food or whatever is available from a different part of the country. Why aren't we trying to get our demand from our domestic manufacturers or our local manufacturers to do the same? Right, so it becomes this engine of improvement simply by in the same room comparing like with like, that they raise the standards of consumers, they raise the standards of manufacturers. And this, some members of the Society of Arts decide that Britain needs this too. Right, they become kind of paranoid, although Britain seems to be ahead in terms of economic growth, you know, the Industrial Revolution becomes very obvious in the 19th century compared to other countries, including the neighbours like, like France, even the United States, and Germany and so on. And they, they start getting worried about those other countries catching up with them. And so they think, well, one way to stop them catching up is to use protectionism. But these people believe that actually the best way to do that is through free trade. Um, and an even better way to do that is to have these sorts of competitions of industry. Why don't we have not just a national exhibition of industry, but an international one, where we get all of the manufacturers from all over the world in the same room, all of the products and designs from all over the world in the same, in the same room. And that way, it's not just that your domestic consumers can say, why don't we have the same locally that's available somewhere else in the country? It's also, why don't we, why can't we import these lovely French, these lovely Italian, these lovely Indian or Canadian or whatever um, designs as well? And um, so they, the, the culmination of this is in 1851, um, the great exhibition of the industry of all nations, um, famous for the, the, the vast crystal palace, it was called, this glass building, the largest enclosed space on earth. Um, made with some of the largest panes of glass ever produced, um, 300,000 of them, um, with over just over 6 million people visiting in the space of just a few months, right? So, you know, at a time when actually the population of Britain's um, only a few times larger than that. So this huge, huge number of people um, coming to visit it, a huge, huge success. And the Society of Arts was responsible for at least getting the ball rolling on that, or doing the initial organization before it gets taken over and being a bit more efficient. But the key difference there again, which I'm sure you'll be interested in, is that they do this in a bottom-up way. Whereas in France, they had done national ones that were completely government funded. In Britain, they decide that the real way to, to appeal to the free trade movement, which had had this big success with the abolition of the Corn Laws just a few years earlier, would be to have a bottom-up movement where it would be people you know, for the masses, by the masses, that working people who would have their industry displayed to show off to the rest of the world how great they were and how competitive they could be in this kind of open trade um, environment, 
um, that they would also be the people who would fund it. Um, so they have a subscription-based system to, to get that going and then based on the subscriptions, get a loan and then the thing ends up being so profitable, they're able to pay it all back. Um, so again, another bottom-up um, improvement or another institution that becomes increasingly common. And today those um, continue as the world's fairs. Um, so, you know, every few years, different countries host the world's fairs. Although, unfortunately, since the, I'd say about the 1950s, they became less about industry and having this pro-improvement aim and more just about kind of national branding um whereas you know i don't know whatever country hosts it and so they send you know britain sends lo lots of beef eaters and people in those big fur hats and you know pictures of the queen or something um rather than sh spending you know the best of their technology so that you can compare their technology with those of other countries that's fascinating. Sounds like a little bit like the Olympics of, of inventions. Um, and yeah, that, that, actually that, that, the Olympics that... are sort of inspired by it in, in some ways. They, they oh. think of it as a healthy competition that they can trade, um, they can exchange, you know, goods and services instead of bullets. Um, that this becomes, yeah, kind of a, a contest um, or like an Olympiad, but for, but for industry, for manufacturing. Yeah, and it also shows the world that like if you mingle with more people, you get more ideas. It's not a zero sum game. It's something that you can also benefit from. And I guess the UK realized that at some point. And um, I mean, that's especially very important in the light of what you already have mentioned, like the corn laws and getting rid of like some of these these trade restrictions. So that was basically the same ethos that was behind that. That that is fascinating. Well, they certainly not tap into it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no worries. Uh, and nowadays, though, most people, and if you look again, like in economic textbooks, they would say like, hey, basic science, nobody really cares. Therefore, government has to fund it. Government has to run it. Now, the Royal Society of Arts is an argument against that to some extent. But how do you see that? Do we need government involved in creating inventions and, and new research in this way? Or can that be also done through civil society? I mean, I think it can be done through civil society. One thing that's interesting about Britain in this period is very often they copy um, top-down or state-run institutions and create bottom-up versions of them. Um, and I think there is a certain advantage that that, that that has, which is that those things end up being much longer lasting because they're less prone to being cancelled or kind of defunded at a later stage. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about the Royal Society, that original scientific society in the 1660s, um, is that they always had the expectation that they'd get some government funding, or at least royal funding, and they never actually do. Um, so it never actually ends up being um, state funded. And so they have to rely on subscriptions and they have to rely on donors and other, other sources of funding. And what I think that means is that they get a much broader donor base. Um, and so a lot of these institutions, I think, do well through being... Um, supported by civil society. That said, I don't, I don't have any kind of particular, I'm kind of agnostic about where the money ultimately comes from. Um, you can have a state institution and you can have civil society ones alongside it. I don't see, into, when it comes to innovation, because it's a positive sum game, because the innovation is likely to have these great effects, um, it's difficult to kind of say, oh, well, one kind is more wasteful than others, because actually innovation is inherently wasteful, right? To experiment, you're going to have to waste resources, you're going to have to have failures. As long as you communicate those failures, though, all the better. Um, so in some ways, I'm quite agnostic about that. I think, you know, I don't really care about where the, 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 the money comes from, so long as it is actually promoting innovation. That said, there is that advantage, I think, to having this broader base bottom-up approach, which is that those institutions just seem to last longer. There are loads of examples that Britain is copying of, say, I don't know, some Duke in Italy who sets up a kind of earlier version of the Royal Society. But then that one, you know, just stops because that Duke gets more interested in something else or dies and his son isn't very interested in it um, you know, or something like that. The same with the Society of Arts is that you end up with actually quite a few states copying it in the years in the 1760s, 70s through to the 1800s. Um, and again, as when the government funding dries up, they have other priorities, they have a war to fight or something, often that funding gets withdrawn and so those societies stagnate. One thing that's interesting is that it's the original one, Society of Arts, that's lasted all the way to the present. And it's very different and it's changed in many ways, right? There's even after the Great Exhibition phase in its history, there are other phases where it's doing other things. I just don't, don't even have the time to go into every bit because it has to constantly reinvent itself. But it's still there, it's still going because it's had this kind of broader base.
Very good. Um, before we jump into some of the questions that we get from the audience, um, let me uh, close maybe with like the more provocative questions. Sure. So a waging debate within classical liberal circles is the legitimacy, the legitimacy of intellectual property rights, which includes patents, uh, intellectual property, and so, and so much more. Um, I could not really see like how you what what your story tells because like in the UK there was property rights uh, there were like intellectual property rights and patents going on there and it actually helped innovation and many people make that argument. Mm. On the other hand, we do now, for instance, in the United States, if you want to come up with a new drug that potentially could help millions of millions of people, that costs you a billion dollars at least to go through like the whole process. So there's no chance of like smaller innovators to get into that market because nobody has that capital. So um, what, what, is, what are your insights from the many years of research that you've done on the topic regarding intellectual property rights? Yeah, so interestingly, I think when I started my research, I was a sort of broadly anti-IP. Um, and over time, I think I've come to appreciate some of its merits, but maybe not the ones that um, people tend to cite. So I don't think, for example, that intellectual property actually incentivizes innovation. I don't think that the existence of that regime means that people think I'm going to become an inventor. Right. I think much more important is the fact that they're just inspired to do it. And there are loads of cases of inventors just not engaging with the system at all. That said, I do think it has a very valuable role, which is completely different to that, which is that it incentivizes making inventions public. So the value of the, of the patent system is essentially that it purchases secrets. So in much the same way that the prizes of the, of the Society of Arts in its early years were effectively purchasing the right to publish those inventions. You know, they would even have to send in a model that you would go and visit the site of arts. You could have a go on the machine or whatever. Uh, you know, we've got the bills that in the archives showing that they had to be repaired from time to time because people were like being a bit too vigorous turning some handle or something. Um, so that I think is the main thing. We should think of them as secret purchasing things. And actually, if you look at the very earliest patents, that's actually exactly what they did is very often they were almost a bit like a, um, not so much about intellectual property as they were more like glorified visas, immigration visas, in that very often the monarch would, would get a proposal from some foreign inventor or even some foreign craftsman saying, hey, look, does Britain want to have the Venetian glass industry or the Norman um, weaving industry or something like that? Um, and they would kind of say, look, I'll, I'll introduce this to your country as long as I get this temporary monopoly to be able to to, to prevent other people from competing with it. Um, and as part of it, I'll also be given kind of denizenship -like rights, almost like citizenship rights to come to the country, not be molested by your other subjects and so on. So the early patents are these privileges granted by the monarch um, to incentive, to, to help out these particular cases where they think that they can have almost a kind of, kind of um, industrial policy through more open borders. Um, or at least kind of selecting these highly talented individuals and allowing them to come over and giving them certain privileges in exchange to, in order to attract them. Often actually because they can't afford to pay them. So it's like, we'll give you the monopoly instead of some cash, uh, which one would you rather have? But ultimately it's still about revealing that secret. And part of what they were supposed to do was when they were in the country, they were supposed to teach some native apprentices so that they would introduce that industry and it would actually persist within the country. Um, later on in the 1720s, again, another change that you get is the use of specifications. So public before the, 17th, uh, before the 18th century really just means have the industry there because it's very difficult to keep it secret once you've got a big, you know, great big machine in some house, people can actually just go up to it and look at it and see how it works. It's very difficult to stop people from doing that. But they figure out that actually a way to do this even better would be to have, you know, plans that you could print and you could spread and you could then have that knowledge as dispersed and as available as possible. Um, and so specifications, I think, are extremely valuable in that respect as well. Um, so, again, it's not just paying people to reveal their secrets, but also to actively publicize it or even give them the confidence that they can actively pub publicize it. Um, rather than trying to keep it secret or even semi-secret, you know, maybe revealing a few details, but then holding back some of the key elements of it. Um, very often you find that people before they, you know, even if they're not actually going to use the invention themselves, in order to publish a book detailing how their invention works, in order to sell the patent to someone else, they won't do that until they get the patent on it. Um, so that's where I think it's very valuable. That's where I think it has a role. And when we think about patent reform, I don't think we should be going abolition or strong. We should be thinking, how do we make sure it does that role? How do we make sure that it provides this very effective and relatively cheap 
alternative to secrecy because secrecy is worse than, than the, I think, the monopoly. Um, and if we're not going to be paying them directly, then I think giving them the te that temporary monopoly is a pretty good trade-off in many circumstances. That's very interesting. Uh, Coca-Cola might be uh, disagreeing with you right there because they have been keeping their things secret for a long time, their recipe. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, they've got competitors, right? <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's not the same thing. I it's not the same thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, one uh, member of the audience, uh, Edward is his name, is asking about your opinion on the latest book of, let me see where it is right now. No, I lost it, of course. Uh, Matt Ridley um, and how innovation works. Uh, yeah, so I haven't fully read all of it. I've been kind of skimming some bits of it. Um, obviously, when you're writing your own book, you, don't, you have limited time to, to read, fully read other people's books. Um, but I have been looking for it. I think I agree with lots of lots of parts of it. Um, where do I disagree? That's probably what you're most interested in. Because um, obviously, if, I, if you agree, you can go and read it. Um, where I think I differ is I don't, for example, like distinctions between, although they're very common distinctions made by economists all the time, say between invention and innovation. I use those two words interchangeably. That's how the public uses them. I don't think it's that useful to say that there's a really meaningful distinction between coming up with things, invention, and this kind of application to the market and making things as available as possible to sell it, which is how economists, and, and I think Ridley is popularizing this use of innovation to mean something um, in that kind of vein. Um, what I why I think there are problems with that is that Firstly, it's a bit too market oriented. Um, I think, you know, if, if we're going to make that distinction, you know, we actually want there to be improvement within government processes as much as there is in the private sector as well. Um, a lot of inventors, when they make things public, you know, they might be a civil servant who's come up with a better way to do the postal service or, you know, or they're part of, I don't know, the national defense industry. So in the 18th century, this is shipbuilding, right? Those are the wooden walls of Britain. Um, these are people who are making things public and are applying it, but they're not necessarily market, making it part of the market. Um, they're not kind of selling these inventions. They're not putting it out there in the, into the private sector. Um, and yet I think that's actually still a very valuable aspect of innovation and to kind of forget about that wouldn't work. Now I'm not saying Ridley's doing that. Um, I, what, I'm, what I am saying though, is that when we make that distinction as economists do, and as he's popularizing it, that can sometimes get lost, I think. Um, in being a bit too rigorous to have this dichotomy, um, but that's a very minor quibble, right? This is this is not this is not big. It's not like we're railing against each other on fundamental stuff. There are no minor quibbles in academia. That's how papers get published. Um, <laughs> so that that makes a lot of sense. So let's be a little bit more also bold here because you're spending a lot of your time looking backward, trying to understand what happened, and you gain a lot of fantastic insights during this time. Looking forward, I mean, the most recent innovation that has changed the world fundamentally is, of course, the Internet. Hmm. But um, you probably also look like what's, what else is going on and you're very um, yeah, interested human being. So is there like another innovation on the horizon that you would maybe say like that could be like the next Internet? I mean, I don't think you can have a next Internet in that sense, because the Internet is, in, is important for the same reason the printing press is important. Um, but it has this outsized effect on invention itself because it makes communication so much easier, right? I mean, we're basically at telepathic levels of communication at this point. Um, you know, considering you can have someone, you know, WhatsApp someone else or whatever with their eyes closed and kind of in their hand and then have someone literally on the other half, other side of the globe re receive it instantly, um, is almost telepathic, right? To, to anyone from, from a few decades ago, this is literally, I mean, literally you could probably solve, I think every book in Harry Potter with WhatsApp within the first few pages. I think every single thing that happens could have been solved through instant communication. So it is magic. Um, I can't think of a single plot line that, there that wouldn't have just been immediately resolved had it taken place in the two, 2010s rather than the 1990s. Um, so you've got, you've got, um, I think in, in many ways, internet commu uh, communications technologies are extremely important in that sense. Um, but your question is about, you know, other big things on the horizon. I think there's really exciting stuff potentially happening with longevity 
with our ability not just to live longer, but to, I guess, live younger for longer. Um, it seems as though, and maybe this is going to be one of those things like nuclear fu nuclear fusion, where it's always like a five years away and it never quite happens. But I, I'm pretty, I'm fairly hopeful that we'll have some significant effects um, within the next few decades that maybe extend lifespans by a few decades at least. Um, so, you know, people regularly living healthily into the 120s and 130s and a bit longer, uh, maybe even up to 200, who knows, um, because we'll have kind of solved some of those processes. And I think that I mean, think about the effects of that. There's, that's never really happened at any point before, unless you believe the kind of Old Testament bits of the Bible, where you've got Methuselah living for hundreds of years. Um, you know, although living, although life expectancies have in the past been very low, that was always brought down by childhood deaths, um, you know, infant mortality, which meant that if you survived child, if you in, in, survived being born and then and it being an infant, you were still kind of capped at around 70 to 90, uh, maybe 100 if you were very, very lucky in terms of how long your lifespan was. So extending that quite a lot way further and also people being younger that, that way further. So I'm talking about like a kind of, you know, being in your 90s and being like a 40 year old today in terms of your health problems and, you know, and, and kind of lifestyle and so on um, and what you're capable of doing. Um, that could have very, very dramatic effects on society. And, and that'd be kind of interesting to see where that goes. It would be a thing of beauty because like, I mean, it's not the same as long, I mean, it is the same as longevity because like just as recently as in the 1980s, uh, every second human being on the planet was living in absolute poverty, you know? Um, but now like half of the world is living in, in, in middle class and it's like 10%. Um, lives uh, on less than that ten percent live in absolute poverty. Still too many, but like now these people can live like much longer. They can get access to medicine and yeah. so forth. So it's a thing for beauty. So they have also more time for innovation and creating more incremental or not so much incremental improvements to their life and other people's lives. So that certainly um, would be would be quite exciting. So if you're looking around the world, what would you say? are some of the main barriers that prevents people from being even more innovative these days? That's an interesting one. I think, I mean, because communication is so fast, the, th the main barriers are often not so much to do with communication as they are to do with the kinds of extra bits that you can't just put in an email or, or do over Zoom, I guess. Um, which would be the kind of things that you have to be there to pick something up as a skill or in, in terms of know-how, so tacit knowledge. Now, in some ways, the internet has done this in a really astonishing way through YouTube, right? That you can now teach yourself to do your local, your kind of, your plumbing needs or your even your electrical needs, if you kind of are you know, confident enough. But you can teach yourself these skills, I think, through YouTube in a way that before you would have had to do something like an apprenticeship. You'd have had to learn things. There was only so far that learning, uh, uh, reading about it could actually help you with these things. Now, I think increasingly we're seeing this real transformation in our ability to use video to have to, 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 to teach tacit knowledge, right? Um, the classic example of tacit knowledge being you know, learning to swim or ride a bike. You can't just read a book about it. You actually have to have a go. Um, that said, I still think there are barriers, though, in terms of how much tacit knowledge gets, gets communicated that way. I think there are certain things you still kind of have to be there to do it. And as a result of that, I think some of the main barriers are the barriers that prevent those kinds of physical contacts. Um, immigration barriers um, that prevent, you know, skilled, willing people, inventive people, excited and passionate people from going to where they're probably gonna do the most good, right? Um, because I think there's value in having agglomerations of having hubs where people do meet together. Um, you know, everybody maybe wants to go to Silicon Valley today, maybe it'll be somewhere else tomorrow, but, you know, actually being able to enable people to go there is extremely valuable because I think they get a lot from that. They get a lot from not just the tacit knowledge, but also from those kinds of casual, spontaneous, um, serendipitous contacts, the kind of water cooler conversations they might have and the ideas they might bounce off each other when they're not just in, you know, doing their role. Um, and this is, you know, the threat where things like 
remote working that might, might have an innovation, which is that they might kind of reduce the, the, the chances of those sorts of contacts happening. Immigration barriers is part of that. And also um, um, in terms of their ability to live in those places. So even if you can come into the country, your ability to afford to live there in terms of your rent or your housing prices can also be an issue. So um, often I think planning reform um, becomes a big part of that. Um, the ability of cities and hubs and agglomerations to create sufficient space for people to live cheaply there becomes an extremely large issue as well. Fascinating. Um, and we have seen this throughout time move. Like we had a huge cluster of innovation uh, even before like the Industrial Revolution, way before that, like in the Middle East, uh, where a lot of like math and chemistry and, and poetry was created way before like Europe was still like in the Middle Ages. We're not doing all that much comparatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Then it, it was in the UK, at some, at some point it was in Germany, then it went to Silicon Valley. Now it might be going more to, to Asia um, where we see innovation uh, flourish more. Maybe two questions, like one, what do you think are the, the movers behind those the geographic movements to innovation? And maybe also like, what is a, maybe like a, a nation that is very, very friendly to innovation and, and is really, it's working in their approach of, of facilitating more growth that way? So I think a large part of that is, is institutional. Um, often bottom up in the way I describe. So, you know, I think Britain gains that hub status from, I would say, Renaissance Italy or the Dutch Republic of the Golden Age by in some ways being very lucky. Um, so when Protestantism starts to become this new wave through all, throughout all of Europe, one of the few safe places to go as a Protestant becomes Britain. Um, and so they get a lot of Huguenots, which are these French um, Protestants. They get a lot of Protestants from Venice, from, from, from Germany, where they maybe face persecution. And so by being the place that all of the religious refugees are going, um, Britain ends up with a lot of extremely inventive and highly skilled people. Um, so there's luck in that respect, but also, you know, there's actually a lot of institutional um, change or, or rather lobbying that goes on as part of that as well, where, you know, inventors are getting the government to be open to those people, to allow them to go there, to be open to those skilled people. Um, and also to often be more proactive in getting them to come over, you know, getting their ambassadors to actually identify who the most skilled glassmaker in Venice is and try to poach them for the country. Um, and I think that often has a, a large part to do with it. So if you look at um, the United States after World War II, I mean, it benefits hugely from pretty much poaching a lot of German scientists um, and other scientists from across Europe before that as well. Um, and many of them will have been instrumental in creating those new hubs uh, in America. So often I think partly about those countries being in that respect lucky um, when you have these problems elsewhere in the world and that don't affect them, um, but also partly about that individual initiative that comes from locals very often to lobby for those sorts of laws. Um, for lobby for that kind of government attitude in particular as well. Um, so where do I see it going next, I guess was the second part of that question. Well, I'm not so sure. Um, I think, you know, there's still a lot of juice in the, the American tank when it comes to their innovation hubs. I think it's also difficult, however, to say where the hubs truly are because, you know, right now we've got more inventors on the planet than have ever existed in human history. Uh, you don't even need them to be that larger proportion of the world's population, even if it's a declining proportion of the world's population. In terms of the aggregate numbers, there's more of them than at, a, at any other point, thousands more, millions more, perhaps. Um, and they're spread all over the world. So I think there's probably a lot of hubs out there that we're just not very aware of, even though some of them in the media get a lot more attention, um, like Silicon Valley, let's say, or Shenzhen for manufacturing. Wonderful. Yeah, that is certainly like an optimistic note that we can end on. Um, and we just have to continue that crisis like the one that we're living in right now with COVID and also economic turmoil continues to be a catalyst for change. And maybe just because people need to, they need to be a little bit more in, ingenious in creating uh, mm -hmm. more and better products and services. Um, I certainly believe in the, in the human spirit. And I think from all of your research, um, you have become also very optimistic in this regard to see uh, how some individuals come from very poor environments and then are able to contribute on a national scale with some innovation that benefits millions of people. 
Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, maybe you want to just close and talk about your favorite inventor that you have uh, studied and what he or she did. Gosh, that's an interesting one. My favorite inventors are never favorites because of what they did in terms of their invention, but more to do with the incidents of their lives. Um, one of the most interesting is a guy called Benjamin Thompson, who's an American born, but he fights on the loyalist side. So for Britain in the American Revolutionary War. Um, and he ends up going to Europe and he ends up as Count Rumford because he becomes best friends with the Prince Elector of Bavaria. And so he becomes a Count of the Holy Roman Empire, um, having just been this kind of, you know, rural school teacher in, in, in pre-revolutionary America, he ends up as Count Rumford. And interestingly, Rumford is actually a place in America, even though they abolished their hereditary titles um, when they became independent. So he somehow managed to, managed to basically, when he was asked, you know, which name do you want? He chose this place um, back, back, back in America. Uh, and so he's involved with various improvements to uh, chimneys, to ovens. He's very interested in, in heat and light and the properties of energy. Um, he's a founder of, and he's also interesting because he founds another institution, which I haven't even mentioned at all, called the Royal Institution, which also exists to this day, um, which is a kind of nowadays a sort of science promoting organization, but also becomes a kind of lab for some of the greatest scientists of the age, like Humphrey Davy or Michael Faraday um, of the 19th century, um, who, and then many more scientists later in, through the 20th century who are really pushing forward the way that physics works. Um, so he has this outsized effect, but he just has this really incredible life in that he manages through, I think his kind of gift of the gab, his ability to just persuade people of things. Being this sort of innovation consultant floating around Europe and, and helping out different rulers um, and becoming a minister in, of various Bavarian ministries all at the same time and you know, having military exploits on top of his inventive exploits and then ending his days in Paris married to the widow of Antoine Lavoisier, one of the main pioneers of, of modern chemistry. Um, and they have this horrible, horrible relationship. They absolutely loathe each other by the end of it. And there's all sorts of fantastic stories about um, her wanting to be the center of the soirees and the kind of Paris, you know, talking, conversational culture and him being a crotchety old man and not wanting to talk to anybody. And so forcing her to conduct her soiree over the garden fence and in, in retaliation, she uh, pours boiling water over all, all of his flowers. So, you know, great. There's just lots of, he's my favorite, I think, because of all of these lovely personal stories and anecdotes throughout his life. Um, but then actually there's, there's of the 1500 or so, there's so many others um, that I could choose from, but he always stands out to me. Uh, there was certainly not a lack of passion in his life that propelled him uh, throughout all of these countries and producing sometimes value, sometimes drama. Um, but yeah. that, that is certainly very interesting. Well, Anton, thank you so much for, for being here today and, and sharing your insight. We really appreciate it. If people want to learn more about you, there's AntonHouse.com uh, and his Twitter is the same thing. Uh, so any, any other um, things that people should uh, check out to Dr. Anton House? So there's my book which I'll plug again, Arts and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Change the Nation, available on Amazon, um, available on um, the Princeton University Press website and with the code AAM20, so Arts and Minds 20, AAM, um, that's 25% off and free global shipping. Um, so that, I guess, given the internationality of SFL might be a, a very valuable to people outside of the, uh, the US and Europe. Um, Wonderful then. Thanks again so much for being here and I wish everyone of the listeners a wonderful day and thank you.